technological skills um, and concepts that are going to allow you to hopefully become better at creating or fostering winning habits well within yourself and then if you're taking it from a team perspective or a coaching perspective uh, helping create winning habits for your athletes so just to start off um, the first thing I want to do is operationally define what I mean by habits. So one of the first things that I want you to consider is that habits are a special form of learned behavior. So when I talk about learned behavior, we move through a certain process when we're learning and typically you would think of it as a trial and error, right? So we'd start, we'd try something out, we fail, we learn from it, we adapt, we try something new, try again, right? So I'll give you a basic uh, example of how this would work. So imagine I wasn't born in today's society. I came from somewhere else where I was in fat from a young age, but I noticed that I have some dirty teeth, right? So I noticed this is unenjoyable and I want to fix it and have some clean teeth. So the first thing I try is drinking some water, it makes my mouth feel a little bit better, uh, but it doesn't really clean it, right? So now I try again, I try something minty, maybe a breath freshener. It's done wonders for my breath. I feel a, a nice tingling sensation, but my teeth are still dirty. Try once again, this time with another uh, minty flavor, but this time it's attached to a toothbrush and suddenly I get that white smile that I am looking for, right? So I've gotten all this dirt off my teeth and I've learned that this is a successful behavior for achieving the outcome I'm looking for. And when I try it again, the next time I have dirty teeth, well, it turns out it cleans my mouth again. Now, I'm being overly simplistic here for a reason to illustrate the concepts, but we'll get further into it later, right? So you do this until you find a reliable solution. And once you find a reliable solution, this is where we start to see the formations of habits, right? So if I've done it once and it works and then it doesn't work again, then I'm less likely to actually create a habit because it's not reliable. So my first take home for you, I don't know if this will be seen, is um, that habits are reliable solutions to reoccurring problems, right? So if your problem that only occurs once every 20 years, you're not going to form a habit. It's something that happens often. You find you do a behavior, it provides a solution. And once that happens, you begin to automate it and it becomes systemic. So now I'm going to try and sell you why habits are important. So the first reason that they are important is that they allow us to automate our decisions, right? So a couple key concepts that I want to bring forth. First is that every single decision you make actually requires a small degree of cognitive effort. So when we actually start to think about decision making and behaviors, we can separate them into either controlled processing or automatic processing. So controlled processing is something that you have to think about deliberately and exert a certain degree of energy, right? So if I am controlling something, it would be, for instance, my mouse right now. I have to think to move it and point it. Where automatic processing would be taking care of my breathing. I can do it without thinking, therefore it requires very little brain uh, power, right? So you might be thinking, hey, um, decisions, yeah, deciding whether or not I'm going to have cereal or toast one day um, is not a big deal, right? It doesn't require that much effort, but if we go through our day and we're waking up and we know we want to ask ourselves, hey, what am I going to have for breakfast? I'm not sure what it's going to be. What am I going to wear? Is that appropriate? Are people going to like it? Am I going to work out today? If so, what workout? Am I going to study? What topics, right? So these all add up on their own, they're small, but throughout the day, we actually end up making on average about 226 uh, controlled, thoughtful decision making decisions, right? So we can start our day with a full tank in terms of cognitive energy and finish off with an empty tank if we are making controlled process related decisions throughout the day versus automating them, right? So when you work automate them, then you can remove all of these decision making and start to use that energy towards decisions that are more important in the day. So to illustrate this point, I'm going to show you a closet. Okay, so who can guess who owns this closet? 
You can do it in your head to see if you get it right. Uh, you might be thinking a first year undergraduate student, he's gone to Walmart or got himself a pack of Hanes shirts. Um, turns out this is a closet of someone who's worth $88.2 billion. So if you don't know him, this is Mark Zuckerberg. And when asked, why do you dress in such a simple fashion? He says, well, I like to eliminate all of the decisions in my day that aren't worthy of making so that I have the cognitive effort to focus on things that make me money and that matter. So matter a lot, it's helpful. So this is the first one. So if you have habits and you set your behaviors and if I know what I'm going to eat for breakfast and I know what I'm going to wear in the morning and I know that I'm going to work out, well then I can keep this cognitive effort for important decisions later on. So in a similar fashion, habits also allow us to automate behaviors. So how does this happen? So this actually happens through the process of repeated uh, behaviors and practice. And this is basically when you repeat a behavior enough, the process is actually called myelination. So when your nerves are firing in a systemic way in a repeated fashion, you actually start to develop a fatty tissue that allows for a more effective signal to be launched uh, or sent throughout the brain. And when you create these motor patterns and, and these motor patterns are fired often together, you actually start to store these more complex movements in the basal ganglia of your brain. Now, I don't wanna to get too tied up in the weeds here, but essentially you can send out a complex signal that allows all of your body parts to know what to do. And because they've fired together so often, they're going to be more efficient and quick and require less energy to actually execute the same task. So let's get out of the brain and just give you a real world example of this. So I have a lot of kid examples and baby examples. Um, if you don't know, I recently had a newborn, so that's on my brain. So we have here a child, right? So if you see a kid trying to learn any kind of uh, motor task, you can see that it takes a lot of cognitive effort. So if you give, I don't know how old this kid would be, two or so, and you try and get him or her to stick handle a ball, you're gonna see they stick their tongue out, they're moving in a not very smooth way and it requires all the effort they can muster to just move that ball a little bit. Now through years and years and years of processing uh, or repeated behavior, we can actually automate it. So that highly skilled stick handling, so I have my example, example here, Datsu, um, he can stick handle without thinking. So now when he's stick handling and making his moves, instead of focusing on trying to move that puck, he can focus on gaps on other players' positions, right? So this happens through repeated solutions and repeated behaviors. So you start to automate them and requires less energy. So those are two benefits. The third benefit is that habits actually act as compound interest for performance. So if we think about this, we'll do a little bit of some mental math here. But basically, if we look here and we consider some person who were to make to get 1% better every single day, right? So if you were to get 1% better every day for one year, you would essentially be 37.78 uh, times better than you were when you began, right? So 1% compounding on 1%, compounding on 1%. Now, if you were to get 1% worse every single year or every single day of the year, then by the end of the year, you would almost be completely out of the skill that you began with. So what does this mean? This means that good habits actually make time your greatest ally, where bad habits make time your greatest weakness. I personally had this as a uh, sport experience myself, where I was a highly talented athlete as a young person who hated practicing. And uh, because I did so, I sort of just plateaued and then everyone else who practiced eventually got so good that I couldn't catch them. So I am not a professional athlete, I am now a professor <laughs> who studies why I made it. So this is important, right? So the 1% better 
and I've told you that this is going to multiply, but let's just imagine even being 1% better than others in your domain. And this becomes incredibly important, especially uh, when you're talking about winner take all environments such as sport. So when we think about this, what do I mean by a winner take all environment? So if I go back to the Olympic results, We have our runners, right? We have Hussein Bolt, Gatlin, and DeGrasse, right? And if we look at this, we actually see that Hussein Bolt, lucky for my math in this 1% example, he's basically 1% better than Gatlin was. I believe that was Gatlin, yes. And so he wins the race, right? And if you ask anyone uh, who's ever got silver, and ask them whether it's 1% worse than gold, they're gonna tell you that it's far worse than gold, right? So not only is that reward in terms of gold versus silver qualitatively different, you also tend to get more disproportionate rewards outside of just the victory itself, right? So this disproportionate rewarding of the winner in sports will actually act to create an even greater gap than existed in the first place. So what do I mean by this? This athlete receives more money, more sponsorships, probably better training, better facilities, and then this gap continues to grow. Another way to kind of conceptualize this is if you imagine two plants growing at the same time, one with slightly bigger leaves are going to capture more sun and then eventually get taller than the other one, and then the shadow will take the other sun and it will grow disproportionately faster. If you're looking for a plant-based example. Question for everyone, just to show the disproportionate rewards, can anyone name the fourth place runner? I know I can't, right? So that would not be 4% less valuable than winning first, second, or third. And we see this too, not just in terms of sport, but we see it outside, so if you don't know, this man, Jeff Bezos, he started a company where he was selling books. He became slightly better than people at doing that. And essentially he's worked his way at gaining 1% advantages in multiple areas of life that then allows him to transfer into new areas and take over the world. So the first portion was basically to sell you on habits being important and valuable. Now I'm actually going to talk to you about how we form habits. So habits are basically formed through four steps and we've seen most of the steps already actually. And I'll come back to my toothbrush example, right? So three of the steps actually involve a trigger. So something that's going to make you want to behave in a certain way or cause a problem for you. Then you have a solution and a reward. But one of the problems that we're missing in this equation here is actually intention, right? And intention is fostered by craving. So here's the four state things that you want to consider when you're trying to form a habit. And when I'm talking about trying to form a habit as a coach, I basically want you to think of habit formation, not in terms of motivating people um, from a rah-rah perspective, but motivating people by becoming an architect of the environment. So we're gonna think about these concepts because this is your basic habit, habit loop. So we have some, a problem or we have something that we want solved or we want to occur, drive some sort of craving. We provide a solution and an attempt to get your reward. If you get it, you get rewarded and it becomes reinforced. So in this example, we have our, our dirty teeth. We have our solution here, the toothbrush. We have our nice, white, clean mouth that we're looking for. And the craving itself is that want or that need to have that nice, clean, pretty smile. Now, I know you're saying, why is this uh, guy so focused on brushing your teeth? One, my family are all dentists other than me. Um, so it's in the family, but two, there's a fun fact about this that really is interesting. So after uh, World War I or around the World War I period, 
in the United States, only about 7% of people were brushing their teeth regularly. And it was such a concern that when they were drafting people for the World War, um, there were so many people with rotting teeth that it was considered a national security risk. So what happened? They brought in a very wise advertising psychologist, uh, Claude Hopkins, and he worked for Pepsodent. So what he did was he tapped into this loop, right? So what he said, I need to create, we have a problem, we have a solution, we know that brushing your teeth fixes it, but we don't have that craving. So what he did with advertisement was he started assigning uh, value to it so that it was something attractive, right? So if you brush your teeth, you can have this alluring smile, you can be this attractive person and have people want to be with you. And suddenly after his advertising uh, campaign, he created this craving, this craving to look good. And once that set in and became the norm, the numbers of people who brushed their teeth immediately jumped to uh, 65% in about a year. So fun anecdote on why the craving is important. So how can we use this as coaches, right? So again, I told you I want you to think of yourself as an environmental architect, right? So one of the main ways in which you're going to be able to get your athletes to form proper habits is to build environments that support the behaviors that you're looking for. I'm also going to give certain behavior change strategies that you can use and that you can teach for uh, your athletes to become better habit uh, setters and have it um, follow through with their habits, right? So let's think about the four, right? We, we need a trigger, we need a craving, a solution, and a reward. So in order to actually foster this, we can hack this system. And how do we do it? Well, the first rule that you can use is make the behavior or the response unavoidable, right? So you want your trigger to be unavoidable. You can't get away with the thought, you can't miss it, and a good way to conceptualize making your trigger unavoidable is thinking about rotten food in the fridge, right? So when we're thinking about our food in the fridge and this lady here is smelling some rotten food, where do you guess in this fridge that that rotten food is going to be? It's likely gonna be tucked away in the back somewhere here where it's not seen, right? So if your plan is to eat all of the food that you buy, the food that you don't see is what you tend to avoid. Now this is a good metaphor for the same behaviors, right? If it comes to, let's say, working out, if it comes to training, if it's not obvious to you that you need to do it or that you should be doing it, then you're less likely to do it. So another good example here, um, my wife who just gave birth when she was pregnant, she had a little scare on the stairs. She likes to run up and down the stairs which is not good when you're a pregnant woman. So she had a little scare one day, it upset her. So then I put up these signs. I'll give you a little zoom in, said slowly, I have hearts because she's my wife and I'm being nice. Um, so when she would walk down the stairs, immediately she'd start running because it was part of her habit. She's an active woman who likes to run upstairs for some reason. And immediately she'd see this sign and go, oh, slowly. And she would say it out loud and walk down the stair and we never had a problem again. Never had any scares. Another example, now again, both my wife and I are psychologists. So here's her saying slowly, slowly reading the sign. But she also does this to me. And this is actually called pointing and calling. And if you're in um, any kind of work environment, you can actually reduce errors by 80, 90% if you have people point and call where the error typically occurs, right? Uh, this is a technique that's worked, used in the military too, where everyone repeats and calls what they're supposed to do. You often will see it in sport too. So someone might yell swing, 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 and each athlete that is get, receiving the ball will then iterate the plan. Same thing if you're working on a system in hockey, if you have an, a, a call for it, you'll say blue, the goalie yells blue, the D yells blue, the forward yells blue, everyone knows and you're on the same page. <laughs> like I said, my wife is also a psychologist and uses habit hacking on me. So 
there's my lovely shirt I planned to wear tonight. Um, she actually cares what I wear. I don't. I always choose the first shirt on the top of the pile. So when it comes down to fall, she will put fall colored shirts at the top and I always end up wearing fall fashion, right? So I'm always dressed right, otherwise I don't care. So she makes it unavoidable for me. I open the drawer, that's the shirt I'm gonna wear and I put on my nice fall clothes when it's time. So I've been talking about in my home, but how do we see this or how do we implement this in sport? So when it comes to this, um, and again, if anyone's listening and wants to ask a question about this or share an anecdote on how they uh, use this technique, you can stop me, we can go over it. Um, I'm gonna give two examples here. So one, um, one example that we see often is if you value certain behaviors, well then we have this written in the dressing room. It's on posters, it's on, uh, you know, right here in this dressing room, it's right in the center. So if you want people to be respectful and that's a habit that you want to develop, well, if it's staring you right in the face, it's hard to then go on the field and behave in a way that is counter to your team, uh, team's core values, right? Another example would be here. Um, if you want your players to go over the different systems you're planning on running against a team, well, what's the best way to do that? If you want to make it unavoidable, well, then what I would do is I would walk around this dressing room and I would put a printed uh, copy of what we're going to run, what they run, how are we going to counter it on their on their seat so when they walk in they have a book that's staring them right in the face that they have to move to get dressed right so if it's right there they're more likely to pick it up and take a look so i've given you some environmental strategies here and when i'm talking about environmental strategies, i just want you to think about this when you're when you're thinking about behaviors that you want to become habitual Think about whether or not you're making them obvious. So now two behavior change strategies that you can do. Pointing and calling is one that I was talking about before. Um, another one is implementation intentions. So what we actually see is that people are significantly more likely to actually perform a behavior if they write out their intention to do so. So this is quite simple. You get your athletes to write out um, an implementation intention and follows this rule. I will do this behavior at this time and this location, right? So oftentimes the athlete is not actually missing the motivation. What they are missing is the clarity on what their intention is to be, right? So by simply writing down, I will perform my skills training at 7 a.m., tomorrow at the dome, they will be more likely to actually do it. So have your athletes write down what they intend to do that are going to um, exhibit the behaviors that you're looking for. So the process that will relate to the outcomes you want. Now the second one that you can use is habit stacking. And what habit stacking does is it actually relies on an already established um, habit and then you pair with it a new habit. So the finishing of the completion of the first habit becomes the trigger of the second one. So I do this at home um, in terms of my pre bedtime routine. I will take my floss, I'll put it on my, like wrap it around the top of my, my toothbrush. Again, a toothbrush is an example for you. So if I'm going to brush my teeth, it's unavoidable. It's on my toothbrush. I take it off, I floss, and then I brush my teeth, right? So when I finish flossing, I then begin brushing my teeth. And then when I finish brushing my teeth, I then use mouthwash. And now you know about my, my uh, dental hygiene. So a good way to think about this is basically after my established habit, I will begin my new habit. And this is one of the reasons why you often hear the concept that you should begin your day by making your bed. Right? So you're using your established habit as an anchor. So the idea behind this is that once you do one good habit, and if your habit's stacking, 
then they're going to lead to progressively more habits being done in a row, right? So the difference between starting your day, you make it an easy habit to do, you make your bed, it's a good choice. Well, then now you've accomplished something, you're feeling like you have a little bit more motivation, you've increased your self-efficacy to be a good habit producer. You then eat a healthy breakfast versus a non-healthy breakfast, right? So if I eat healthy, then I'll feel better and I'm more likely to be able to train effectively. Or if I don't make my bed, and then I eat poorly, and then it's time to go to the gym, I feel like crap, so I'm not gonna try very hard at the gym, right? So to have a compound effect again. So making a good habit to begin with, start with an easy one, and then snowball off of it. So the next one is you need to, again, create that craving, right? You want to create an intention, so to do so, you want to make it attractive. Now, if you're lucky, your habit is going to be inherently irresistible, right? So it's going to be something that you absolutely love doing. But unfortunately, this is not usually the case, right? So usually the case is that bad habits are inherently irresistible. So eating a chocolate bar, um, you know, watching Netflix instead of working out, these things feel good right away. Usually the habits that are good for you don't feel good right away. They actually take a while and you're not getting that immediate reward. So what do you do when this is the case, right? How do we take something unattractive and turn it into something we want to do? So one concept that we can use to understand this and we can apply it to athletes is the pre-MAC principle. So essentially what this, and this in a layperson's term is known as grandma's law, but uh, what you do is you pair an unattractive behavior with an attractive one, right? So if you want, you have to eat your, once you're finished your vegetables, then you can have your dessert. We see parents do this all the time, um, providing a reward for doing something that's not necessarily overly enjoyable, right? We see it outside too. Um, my example here, I will go to the movies and watch any movie because I love popcorn. And so I've added an activity that is very enjoyable to me, eating you know, a family's worth of popcorn in one sitting, and then I'll watch whatever movie that's remotely um, attractive to me. Another one that I did, I recently took up uh, biking. So I've been biking a lot at my house. I wasn't overly into biking before, didn't find the seats overly comfortable. Now I'm hooked. But originally what I did was I took things I loved and paired them with my biking. So I love to listen to podcasts. So I made it that I was only allowed to listen to podcasts when I would bike. So when I got on, I would crave a podcast and I'd say, you're not allowed to do it unless you bike. So then I started craving the bike because I wanted the podcast. And eventually by biking and becoming more proficient at it, you start to enjoy that yourself. You start to integrate it within who you are and your motives become more intrinsic. Same thing, if I wasn't podcasting, I'd do Netflix on the bike. So some sport examples, I'll give you a one with younger athletes. So when I was helping coach three, three to five year old soccer, um, you'd have them play, you'd have, their, have them do their drills for about 15 minutes or so, and then tell them, you know, if you made it through it, we'll play, what time is it, Mr. Wolf, which they really enjoyed a lot more than soccer. So I would, we would pair Mr. Wolf with soccer so that these athletes would want to return again because they had a good time. And they said, oh, I love soccer because I get to play, what time is it, Mr. Wolf? Now, if we're trying to think at a higher level, higher sport, you can think about pairing things that maybe athletes don't enjoy as much with things that they really do enjoy, okay? So if we are talking about a varsity athlete, right? Maybe a varsity athlete or a pronghorn, we often see that they love potlucks and team din dinners. So that could be your reward for something maybe like study hall that they don't necess necessarily want to attend to. So say, we're gonna have our potluck immediately after study hall. So all the athletes come together, they study for an hour, and then afterwards they have a team dinner 
and they really enjoy it. And by pairing study hall with team dinner over and over again, you can actually get athletes very excited for study hall. So those are different environmental changes that you can do. Um, I mentioned the pre-MAC principle. And then the second thing that you can do is value spotting, right? Oh, so pre-MAC principle in terms of how you would lay it out. After the behavior I need to do, I will do the behavior I want to do. So that's the pairing. And you want it to be pretty closely followed, right? You want the reward to be close after uh, the desired behavior. So that's where we have study hall followed immediately by the team dinner. So with value spotting, um, one of the things you can do is play a little bit with semantics, right? So when you're value spotting or spotlighting, sorry, you're going to showcase why. So provide the answer of why you are doing the, the behavior and make it something more attractive, right? So we need to work out because, you know, that's uh, part of the game. It's something you have to do as an athlete is not inherently uh, something that you crave, right? But if you start phrasing your workouts and your training as we get to be stronger, um, and this is how we're going to be faster, stronger, right? This is your opportunity to get bigger, stronger, faster than your opponent then the athletes might start to internalize that message and crave that ability to start to gain a competitive edge. So how you talk about your activities as well is going to have an impact on whether or not your athletes are going to want and crave that activity itself. So the first one's covered. We're gonna move now to the second principle. So you want it to be as simple as possible. People are designed to uh, go through behaviors in the least difficult way as possible. So if you're presented with two options, human beings tend to, to move towards the simpler option, right? So we see this outside of sport in the sense that McDonald's does this strategically. So they'll design their menus. They're always identical no matter what country you go to. They even try to design their restaurants to look the same so that you know how to navigate yourself through the restaurant, you know exactly what to order. If you crave a Big Mac, it's going to be there and it's going to, and it's going to taste exactly the same. It'll be the same number, number seven on the value meal or whatever it is, right? So they make it as easy as possible for you to get the exact same experience that you want. We see this too with Netflix, um, where they add in the, uh, the loop where they'll just jump to the next episode. So you don't even have to click play anymore. If you remove that, you're less likely to binge watch TV. But they've made it so simple that it's actually harder to not watch the episode, right? So they've made it so simple to watch, all you have to do is stay still. If you don't want to watch it, you have to get up, get the remote, and stop it. Personal example, um, my wife has sometimes has eczema. Um, actually, Lethbridge has been great for it, uh, for her hands. Um, but what I did was, I bought, this is actually, if you have eczema, a really great over-the-counter cream to help. But what I did was I took um, this bottle uh, that's very helpful for her, and I bought one for every environment that she's in. So if she's in the living room, there's a bottle there. We have a bottle in the car. There was a bottle in her office. There's a bottle upstairs. There's any single room that she goes into, she can find a bottle, and if she has any kind of irritation on her skin, then every room she's in, it's easy for her to treat. If it's upstairs or she doesn't know where it is, then it's not gonna be likely. And she has not had any issues for years. So here's a solution I use at home. Now, how could we use this in sport? So a good example would be meal prepping. So if you want your athletes to eat properly, well, provide maybe with a meal prep plan right, or encourage them to meal prep because it's much easier to do. Then when your meals are made, you get home, you don't have to think about it, it actually would be harder for you to go order food than to just grab this meal and heat it up. Another thing that you can do is automate your schedule. So here's mine, I live and die by my email schedule, it goes to my phone and it tells me what I need to do. 
right? So it's super easy. It comes to my phone. I don't have to look. So then I end up doing exactly what the phone tells me to. <coughs> so this uh, is important, right? And you want to automate basically whenever you can. So I think the, the first talk by Dave, I don't want to butcher the name, Wack, Wack, no, uh, sorry, the basketball coach. Sorry, I can't say your name. Um, this can also tie into like your into your cultural norms. So if you want others to um, help each other, right? So if that's one of your core values, then when you see someone who needs help and you've made it a core value, you've talked about how that's important to the team, well, then there's no thought required, right? So this is a value no matter what, we operate under the as pronghorn athletes, we help each other. So there's no cognitive effort required to make the decision. It's simple, it's clear. When you see someone needs help, you help them. All right, so another way to make it easy is that habit stacking. So again, now I had my study hall paired with my team dinner. Well, again, if I want them to practice, study, um, you know, you, and you can make a chain or a link of behaviors that you want and habits that you want and connect them together. So have your practice followed by study hall, followed by the team dinner, if you can, right? So the idea here is don't make them have to leave and come back, right? If you want athletes to exhibit certain behaviors, don't put roadblocks in the way, such as lack of time or travel or motivation to come there. So if you have these three paired as one, then all they have to do is get the motivation to get to the sporting environment or practice session. Um, and then everything follows, right? It becomes habitual. All right, certain behavior change strategies that you can use to optimize this and to make things simpler. Um, what you wanna do is start with something that you can manage, right? Then you wanna focus the second strategy is focus on the start of the process. And the third thing I'll talk about is commitment devices. So I'll break these down individually. So when you start with something you can manage, you wanna think about if you're trying to develop sport expertise, these are the processes through which you would create a habit and get someone to be hooked on your uh, training or your behaviors, right? So the first thing you wanna focus on is adherence. Don't set the goal too hard right away. Actually, you wanna build that habit. So what, I, what I'll return to is me and my biking, right? So the first thing I did was I said, I wanna bike 20 kilometers a day. I don't care how fast, how hard it is. I just need 20 kilometers, right? So if I did that, I could put a check mark in my book. I got my little reward and I felt good about myself. Once I was doing that every single day and I was allowed to do it in blocks, I was allowed to do it whenever, just as long as I hit 20 by the end of the day, I won, right? Now when I became more efficient and it started to become something that was part of my daily routine, then I worked on eff effectiveness, right? So am I biking the same way? I actually bought some shoes, like clip-in shoes, so I could be more effective. And then the final one, so this is, are you doing it often? Then are you doing the right things? And then the final step is, are you doing the right things the right way? So this is how you want to develop, uh, develop expertise in terms of uh, habitual behaviors. So again, starting with something that's easy enough to do, and then you want it to become part of their daily routine. Once they're hooked and their established behaviors are part of their daily routine, then you work on making those more effective and efficient. So the second is to focus on the start of the process. So a good example here would be to lay out your workout clothes at, the, at uh, the door or at the base of your bed. So when you wake up, one, they're very visible. And two, um, all you have to do is grab them and go get started. The other thing too might be to put them on, right? So maybe that's your first task. I'm gonna put on my gym clothes and then I get a check mark, right? So again, when we remember, uh, when I was talking about habits stacking together. So just putting on your gym clothes is easy, right? 
or maybe your first choice is driving to the gym. So just focus on getting there. You don't even have to work out, just go to the gym. And then once you get to the gym, then you're gonna, well, it's easier to stay there than it is to go back home. So you're more likely to actually train. So don't focus on doing 100 sets of you know, 200 pounds, which is grueling and awful. Focus on getting there. And a good way to do this um, in terms of focusing on the start is to use a commitment device. And many people probably have used commitment devices before in the past, but aren't quite aware of what they are. So an accountability partner would be a, a commitment device. Commitment device is basically something that you start uh, that makes it almost impossible for you to go back on your word, right? So I, I will call a friend, say, let's go to the gym, let's go train. And then if they say, um, they say yes, well, now I'm committed, right? Another example that I used to do, and I still will do quite often, is if I don't feel like going to train, I'll drink a pre-workout. So I pour a glass and I drink it. And it's super easy to do. It tastes kind of nice. Um, I get that done. That's my first habit, drink the pre-workout. But then if I don't go to the gym, I'm jacked up and I feel very, very sick, right? So once I've had this drink, I pretty much have to go work out. And it's an easy start decision that's going to lead to the beneficial behaviors later. All right, the final one is you want to make it rewarding. So whatever you can do to make the behavior itself rewarded, you wanna do it and you want that reward to come quickly. My example at home is water. I really don't enjoy drinking water, uh, but for some reason when there's carbonated, uh, when it's carbonated, I love it and I drink a ton. So I've taken this consistency here, changed it, and now I drink liters a day. So now I'm well hydrated. Another thing that's very simple, if the activity again is not enjoyable, a checklist, they're super, super satisfying, right? So giving your athlete a checklist, they create, they do the activity, it's not enjoyable, but then they get to knock it off the list. That's one way to make it satisfying and rewarding. Another way in, inside of sport, uh, we see it all the time is using small area games to develop skills. So this is something that instead of just doing your basic drills, that you could foster the development of skills through enjoyable components of the sport. You can also reward, uh, reward it with a final game. We would do shootouts in hockey, uh, 10 puck, rebound, different games. And then the final one, which is super easy to do, it costs nothing, uh, is praise, right? So if someone who's worked hard, they've done something, that made you happy, just say, good job, uh, you've done great. It's very rewarding to uh, perform and have people recognize it. So now, what behavior strategies can you use for this one? Um, provide rewards as soon as possible, right? It's the same thing as if you're training, let's say a puppy and it pees on the carpet, you don't come home 10 hours later and rub its nose in the carpet because it doesn't remember it's done it. The second that you should do is uh, track habits and reward it, right? And reward the process and then use your commitment devices. So providing the rewards fast. Um, again, this is why we tend not to see that physical activity interventions are effective or they tend not to be very effective because the rewards don't come right away. It takes months, right? So you have to provide that reward immediately. And if it's not necessarily the desired outcome, you need to replace it with something until that outcome comes. Tracking them is a great way because tracking, um, it makes it unavoidable. It creates the craving because you want to shade in that box, especially when you get a run going. Um, it's very easy and it's super rewarding. You can also turn it into a game. You can have, um, you know, a competition, a leaderboard on your team for athletes who have attended the most sessions or the most training sessions, who has worked out the most often, who stayed hydrated, right? You could have internal competitions, which again, adds some reward to it. Um, commitment devices I've talked to you about. Another one too, 
that we're seeing kind of popping up these days is they have apps where you can pay a certain amount of money and if you don't achieve your goal, it goes away. Um, I've heard other examples where someone will make a commitment to another person and they'll say, if I don't, let's say, lose 10 pounds or if I don't attend five of six practices every week, I want you to take this check and donate it to uh, an anti-cause that I hate, right? So then you have a reason that's going to make you uh, want to go to these different um, activities. So the big take home here is that it's easier to manipulate the environment than it is to manipulate your athlete's willpower, right? So a lot of times you think you have free will. Uh, I've walked around my house and I think that I'm craving grapes, but it just so happens that they're on the table, right? And when they're put further away, then suddenly I don't, right? So use your, if you use this framework and you think about the behaviors that you want to become habits, ask yourself the question, am I making it unavoidable, attractive, simple, and rewarding? And if you're not creating an environment that makes it more likely for them to occur, then, uh, then you might want to restructure them. So I think uh, I'm coming on about an hour, so uh, I can cut here. Okay, we'll give people a couple of minutes to put questions in the chat if they have them. You know, thank you, Scott, for your presentation tonight. Um, just while we're waiting, I'll mention uh, next week, session nine, we have men's soccer head coach Randy Bardock, and he is presenting coaching education and lessons learned. No questions? I uh, haven't seen anything come through. We'll just give another minute. Um, I can give you an example here. It's so easy, even my baby does it. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. So here's my example of my newborn baby. This is Katie. <laughs> so what does she do? She wants certain things from me and she has certain very clear cues, right? So when she goes, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, that's one type of cry. It's unavoidably loud. Um, I want it to go away. I know when she goes, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, it means that she's hungry and I have to bring her to her mom. So I shoot into the room, I grab her, I bring her to Kelsey, and the crying stops. When she goes, eh, 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 like that, well, spring into action. I'm not even thinking. I pick her up, I pat her on the back, unavoidable. I want it gone. It's simple. And it's rewarding because I give her a couple pats, a big burp comes out and the crying stops. And her third one, ahu, ahu, what she does. I know that her diaper's wet and now I'm changing diapers in less than 30 seconds, not even thinking. And I'm flipping through, throwing it out. Mindless, I could even do other tasks by changing a diaper. So environmental manipulation can happen. It's not too hard. If you're interested in reading more, I like to provide these. Atomic Habits is an awesome first read. It breaks down uh, many of the core concepts here, gives some great examples. The Power of Habits, another easy read. It came before Atomic Habits, but I think James Clear does a bit better job. If you're interested in the basics of classic and operant conditioning, then I would go into uh, classical condition operant, operant conditioning. And if you're interested in getting really into the weeds, see some of the social constructs, different ways to create habits using more than just uh, classical and operant, uh, operant conditioning, then The Psychology of Habits is an awesome book. Okay, so we do have a question. Um, do you think it's more important for the habits to be introduced to a team from the coaching staff or by senior players? Um, <laughs> So I would, uh, I would probably, I would probably have it introduced. Both are good. Um, I would probably have it introduced by a, a team leader. So 
when you're learning, you're more likely to learn vicariously through someone who is more similar to you. So an athlete is more similar in terms of your skill, your age, your process, so that when you see them do something and get rewarded, it's going to have a greater impact on you. So I would say it's, it's likely going to be more effective just based on social cognitive theory if it was done by another athlete. And you saw them do it and get rewarded. But if I were the coach, I would work with my team and then have a collective message. So I would be saying it and I would have my leaders repeating it. So then even the language itself becomes a habit and becomes part of your daily, uh, your daily speak. Okay, I think that uh, wraps up tonight. Oh, no, that was just more of a thank you to you, Scott. So um, again. thanks again for your presentation tonight. And uh, remember, the second last presentation of our series will go next week with head coach of the men's soccer team, Randy Bardock. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.